This episode of Mailbag is sponsored by Mint Mobile. Check out the link to Mint Mobile's deal down in the description of this video, because if you don't, you'll make Ryan Reynolds cry. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Mailbag. What is Mailbag? Well, I'm glad that you asked. See, every day on the John Campia Show, Monday through Friday, we take the second half of the show to take live comments and questions from the people watching the show live. However, what if you're one of those people who watches one of the other 22 hours during the day and you have a thought or a question or a comment you'd like to make? Well, good news. That's why we have Mailbag. If you'd like to send in a question to be read on Mailbag by myself or sometimes Rob, simply go down into the description of this video and you'll see a tip link. Click on that there or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movie blog tv slash tip you'll be getting your comment or question read on mailbag if we deem your comment or question appropriate to be used on our show and of course you'll be supporting the channel at the same time and all of us involved with the john campy channel thank you guys so much for your support okay guys without any further ado let's get over to it and start taking your questions shall we and we're gonna get things started off here with brian o'connor who writes if Cry Macho were a critical hit, do you think David Zaslov would still be upset that it was a financial loss? Curious about how he feels about Denis Villeneuve and Dune franchise. Both the box office and HBO Max uh, views were not impressive for Dune. Well, no, actually, Dune what didn't do all that bad. I mean, despite the fact that the previous uh, regime under Jason Kalar made the idiotic decision, completely idiotic decision, to release the movies in theaters and on HBO Max on the same day, Dune still managed to make over $400 million at the box office. Now, is that huge smash numbers for an expensive film like that? No, but it wasn't bad. Then, of course, won all types of Academy Awards. I won the most Academy Awards this year. I actually won six Academy Awards, if I'm not mistaken. At any rate, here's the thing. The, people misunderstand that story about David Zaslav. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, it was a big story the other day that David Zaslav, the new boss of Warner Brothers, he's the head of Discovery. Discovery just bought and took over Warner Brothers, and now he's the big boss, right? And there was a story going around that he was blasting some Warner Brothers executives for the fact that they greenlit Cry Macho, the Clint Eastwood movie, when it you know lost a whole bunch of money. But the thing about it is, is that there are other Warner Brothers movies that lost money. He wasn't upset that Cry Macho lost money. What he was upset was, about was that the Warner Brothers executives knew that that movie was going to lose money and they greenlit it anyway. Like, it's, look, when you're in the movie business, you're going to greenlight projects that you hope make money and then maybe they do and maybe they don't. But the thing is, why would you greenlight a movie that you already know is going to lose us money? And that's what David Zaslav was upset at. He's not upset that the movie lost money. Movies, some movies are going to lose money. That's what's going to happen. The problem was the executives knew it was going to lose money. And they still greenlit it because they felt like they owed it to Clint Eastwood. And to which David Zaslav said the immortal words, the saints show friends, it show business. So it wasn't about whether it succeeded or not. It wasn't about did it get critical acclaim or not. It was about that the executives knew it would not make money and went ahead and greenlit it anyway. And that was the big problem, Brian. All right, thanks for writing that in, man. All right, next up, we got MD who writes, one of two, when you say that the MCU is declining, isn't that based on your opinion rather than anything quantifiable or uh, quantifiable or quantifiable uh, in a vast way? Their projects are still getting fresh scores from critics and audiences on Rotten Tomatoes. Their trailers are still breaking uh, records, their shows trend every week they're on, the box office numbers are still good, pandemic deductions aside. So if you had a meeting with Marvel tomorrow, how would you explain their decline in a way that doesn't involve personal opinion? Well, here's the thing. The decline is all about quality. And quality in movies is always about personal opinion. It always is. Listen, the Transformers movies, after the first Transformers movie, which I like, the Transformers movies went like that. They just declined terribly. But you could say, well, they're still getting box office numbers. And, and sure enough, they were. But eventually that catches up to you. And eventually they got around to the last couple of ones, including uh, Transformers The Last Night. It was it called The Last Night. I think so. The Last Night, that just the box office tank because eventually that catches up with you. Right? And the thing about Marvel is, look, we're all still very enthusiastic about Marvel. But... The response to shows like Falcon the Winter Soldier and Hawkeye 
and even Loki and, and to some degree even Moon Knight have not been as universally positive as they were for WandaVision. There was certainly some division over Black Widow, um, even movies like Shang-Chi, which I think is one of the best MCU movies of all time. It didn't exactly blow up the box office, stuff like that. But, but really, it's more about their quality. Their quality is declining. It's still very good. Like, don't, like people hear me say sometimes that their quality is declining and they think I'm saying that Marvel stuff is now bad. Not at all. I still love it. I mean, Spider-Man was fantastic. Shang-Chi, obviously. Uh, WandaVision is fantastic. But... You know, I would normally go one out of every five Marvel projects that I would say, oh, that was good, but I didn't love it. But, uh, you know, it's still good. But we've gotten so many of those lately. Falcon the Winter Soldier was okay, but it wasn't great. And I think you'll find a lot of people agree with that. Like, you don't get the same amount of enthusiasm and overwhelming love for it like we're used to having for an MCU project. And eventually that will catch up with you like it did with Transformers. So when I say that Marvel right now feels like their quality is in decline um, because of just the sheer number of projects that they're putting out right now, and I'm not saying that can't be turned around, but I am saying that because, you know, you look at movies like Eternals, Black Widow, you know, even some of the, the mixed reaction for, for Doctor Strange, which I like. I like Doctor Strange, but it's not top exactly top shelf MCU. Like, we're just not used to seeing that. So you'd have to kind of have blinders over your eyes to not recognize that the the audience response as well to the Marvel projects is in decline. And eventually that catches up to you. Now, I'm not saying it's going to continue to be in decline. And they still continue to put out something every once in a while that is absolutely phenomenal. And I think Thor Ragnarok is going to blow the doors off of everything. I cannot wait, but... Yeah, that's what I mean. And like you say, but take your opinion out of it. Well, all movies are about opinion. All the movies are about our subjective opinion. And yes, from my personal subjective point of view, as a huge Marvel and MCU fan, it's been a little bit in decline. It's not firing on all cylinders like every single thing that would come out. Because we went years straight where every single Marvel thing came out was fantastic. Now it's like one out of every three or four things they put out is fantastic. A lot of it's still good. A lot of it's still thumbs up. But yeah, that's what I mean when I say it's in decline. And, and I think it's pretty tangible. But, you know, again, all movies is about personal opinion, MD. All right. Thank you for writing that in, man. Appreciate that. All right. Next up, uh, Aaron B writes, hey, John and Rob, just me today. Been loving the show. You guys make every day more fun for us movie loving fans. Well, thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Also, hope Rob gets better soon. He's feeling much better. Again, we're just waiting for him to test negative a couple couple more times to be able to come in. Uh, hope Rob gets better soon. Miss having the whole crew. The Offer has become one of my favorite shows since uh, WT, I don't know what that is, uh, and Succession. Uh, have you checked it out yet? I have so far only watched one episode of The Offer. I'm very late to The Offer Train. Very late to it. Finally got around when I got back from Canada, because I had to go make an emergency trip up to Canada. But when I got back from Canada, I watched one episode and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. So I have not watched the whole thing yet. Anne is almost through everything right now. I think Anne is caught up with everything with it. She's adoring it. I'm one episode in. I'm going to get caught up on the rest. And I'm really liking what I'm seeing so far, man. All right. Thanks for writing that in. All right. Next up. HBO Max Zaslav, I like that, writes, I'm going to defend the past execs of Warner Brothers. The Mule made $174 million on a $50 million budget. It was a profitable movie. So giving Clint $33 million isn't a big stretch for his next movie. Putting it day and date on HBO is another thing, though. But again, there's a difference. The difference is, it's not just, it's a Clint Eastwood movie, and that's all the same. When WB greenlit The Mule, and they saw the project coming together and, you know, you had Bradley Cooper was going to be in it and all that kind of stuff. They believed this is a movie that could make money and it made money. But the WB execs themselves admitted to David Zaslav that they knew they knew the whole time that Cry Macho would not make money. They knew in advance that Cry Macho was going to lose them money, but they just thought, well, We'll keep the budget low, so hopefully we won't lose that much money. But they knew it was going to lose money. See, it would be a different thing. We were talking about this a few minutes ago. 
if, look, the WB exec said, look, we really thought that with a $33 million budget, it could be profitable. And we thought it could be profitable because of this, 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 and this. And if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. But that's not what happened. What happened was, is like, yeah, we knew. Like, we looked at the script, we looked at the story, we understood what the marketing campaign would be, and we knew this is going to cost us money. This is going to lose money. But we greenlit it anyway. That's the part that Zaslav got mad at. If they went to Zaslav and said, no, we, 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 we had a strategy and we thought it could make money and it didn't, you go, okay, that's business. But they knew it was going to lose money and they did it anyway. And that's the part he got upset at. All right. Thanks for writing that in. Uh, Senpaigar writes, I just watched the Chip and Dale movie with my five-year-old daughter. I have to say, there are some really funny parts in this movie, for me anyway. Some really funny voices, cameos, lines, and moments throughout. I was pleasantly surprised with this movie. Listen, I was talking on the John Campy show earlier today. You guys know me. I've said I have zero interest in watching this Chip and Dale movie. I'm not going to watch it. But everybody has said it's good. And then last night, while I was working on some stuff outside and watched it on her own, and she came out and she goes, you know what, John, it's really good. So it's like, okay, damn, now I got to watch it myself. So I'm going to have to get around to it too, Senpai Gar. Thanks for writing in. Next up, we got Adam Martinez who writes, I'm so excited for Stranger Things uh, Season 4 and Obi-Wan coming out on the same day, which is crazy to me. I've read that the last episode of Stranger Things Season 4 is two and a half hours long, while the uh, penultimate episode is an hour and a half. What do you think about this? I, I listen, I think it's great. I think they're giving the runtime of Stranger Things season four is going to be closer to the proper runtime of a season of television than what we've been getting from Disney plus. And you know me, I love a number of the things on Disney plus, not everything on Disney plus, but you know, Mandalorian season one, Mandalorian two, season two, but I am frustrated as a fan that they don't do enough. Like they're, they're, they feel more like short little treats rather than a proper season of television. I like the fact that when you add up the overall runtime of Stranger Things season four, it's going to be closer to the proper runtime of a proper season of television. And I think that's a good thing. I hope other streamers start taking note of that. I really do, Adam. Thanks for writing that in. All right, next up. Guys, we want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Mint Mobile, you know the one with the delightful ads with good Canadian kid Ryan Reynolds? So look, after years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, is that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just $15 a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't a catch. And guys, that's no joke because for years I've been using one of the major providers and it was fine. But I switched over to Mint Mobile a little while ago. The service has been fantastic. And the big difference is I'm now paying about one third of what I was paying before. And the best part for anybody who just hates their phone bills is that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just $15 a month. All their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash campia. That's mintmobile.com slash campia. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash campia. Uh, Cubsy writes, I like that name. Hey John, love the show. Thank you so much. Just wondering if you think Sony slash Disney collaboration will continue and if Spider-Man 4 will be in the MCU or in the Sony-verse, which would you prefer? I would prefer it to be in the Sony-verse. I believe it's going to be in the MCU. And that's perfectly good too. That, don't get me wrong. It's not like I love one and hate the other. That's perfectly good too. So yeah, I think they're going to continue on at least for another film or two. We'll see where that ultimately goes. Look, look what happened with Spider-Man No Way Home. Everybody made money. Everybody made money. The collaboration between Sony and Marvel has been a very, very successful one, both in terms of quality and financial outcomes, right? All their movies have made big money. This last one made is one of the biggest box office hits in the history of cinema. 
Um, so yeah, they are going to continue this on. It's in everybody's best interests. And yeah, I would prefer to see him move over into the Sony verse, to be honest with you, but I think they're going to keep him in the MCU for now. And uh, I got no problem with that because I've liked the results so far. All right. Thanks for writing in, man. Next up, we got Jerome who writes Wanda's MCU story arc is similar to Pet Cemetery. I don't see that, but, uh, where the father brings his son back from the dead. But despite being forced to kill his son who came back evil and killed people, he proceeds to bring back his wife, hoping for better results. Um, I don't understand the similarity of that to, uh, to Wanda because in Wanda creating imaginary children in WandaVision, they didn't go off and do great evil. And then she just thought she'd try to trans, you know, transcend the various multiverses to find other versions of her children. I don't see the connection there, Jerome, to be honest with you. I really don't. Or, or maybe you're just not communicating in such a way that I'm getting your gist, but yeah, I don't personally see the same equation, but thank you for sharing your thoughts anyway, Jerome. All right. Next up, a movie you have to see writes, Hey, John, hope you're doing well. I am doing well. Thank you. I'm adding my voice to the mix of people who are saying you have to see Chip and Dale. I don't think anyone has told you the key, the key yet. The director is the director of pop star. Never stop. Never stopping. I never knew that. That's interesting. I love that movie. It's basically a Lonely Island movie. It's so well done. And the 90s nods never stop. This movie is unreal, so much better than it has any right being. I highly recommend it. 4.5 out of 5 for me. Great comedy. Thanks for all the shows and bring on the filthy. Well, listen, a movie you have to see, uh, you have to see, you're, you're just, you're right. You're adding your voice to the throng. I have not heard from one single person yet, not one, who hasn't liked this movie, including my own wife. Who loved it. So I I don't see how I'm going to get around it either today or tomorrow. Probably tomorrow because I got a little, little bit of free time tomorrow. I think tomorrow I'm probably going to have to sit down and watch this thing because of all you guys telling me about it. So yes, I will get on Chip and Dale. Thank you for sharing that with me. All right. Next up, we go to Jerome who writes, Fans complain about how slash when a character dies because they feel it wasn't what the character deserved. But in real life, we usually don't get what we deserve. Evil people sometimes die peacefully and good people die brutally slash painfully. Your thoughts. Yeah, I have never understood that mentality, right? Like in real life, somebody can just, you know, who's in the middle of a college education, doing this, working on towards something. Blah, 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 and then one day just walking across the road gets hit by a bus. I, I mean, it just happens. And I like that type of reality, even in my fantasy. I like that type of, that's life in my storytelling. And yes, sometimes our heroes don't get the end we want them to have. So, like, I, And listen, I'm not opposed to the fairy tale endings in shows. Not at all. If you do it and do it right, that's great. But I also don't mind at all the suddenness and tragedy of it. I, I'll give it an example. I'm sure most of you guys haven't seen it, but the let's take Downton Abbey, for example. The main guy character, uh, what's his name? Let me, it's something Stevens, Dan Stevens was his name, Dan Stevens. And so before he was, you know, in Legion or Beauty and the Beast, he was in Downton Abbey and he was the central key main figure and he just died in a car accident, right? Just suddenly this, this main character of this show was just suddenly gone. The main love interest, I mean, just gone, just was, and it was not in the middle of a big mission or anything. He was just driving his car from here to there, got in a car accident, died. And narratively, it really worked. So yeah, I, I don't get sometimes, I get it. There's some people who want their fairy tale scripted ending, but sometimes the suddenness of life is sometimes more refreshing to me, but that's just me. All right. Thanks for sharing that, Jerome. Next up, Jerome also writes, question about jobbing. How do you unjob a character? It's not easy. For example, would Superman and Supergirl have to fight again? Also, jobbing is also called the Worf effect, named after Worf in Star Trek Next Generation, because apparently he got jobbed a lot. Well, no, the term jobbed was around before Star Trek The Next Generation was ever on. Yeah, so let's, people misunderstand jobbing. Just having one character lose in a fight to another character is not jobbing, all right? Jobbing is more in-depth than that. Jobbing is when the whole reason your character is there is to make the other character look better. And that's the only reason you're there. 
you are there to put over the other person. Like in professional wrestling, uh, I think what was the I think there was a wrestler named Al Snow. I think I think that was his name, and he created this thing called the Job Squad in thing because it was filled with jobbers. But the idea of is like the whole exclusive reason this character is brought into this is to look bad to make another character look good, right? Just lose one character losing a fight to another character is not jobbing. In the case of the Supergirl TV series, Superman was a jobber through and through. The only reason they brought in Superman into that show was to make Supergirl look good. That was the only reason he was there. He got brought in to constantly get beat, say things like, the world doesn't need me, Superman. It's got you. You are the true hero of Earth. Like constantly being subjugated to just being there to look bad so Supergirl looks good. That's a jobber. Hulk losing a fight to Thanos was not jobbing. Uh, so-and-so character just losing a fight to another character is not jobbing. It's it's more thorough than that, right? And so there's not a lot of examples of jobbing uh, in movies. But yeah, to undo a job like that, yeah, it would take a reversal of it, I think, pretty heavily. Anyway, that's just me. Okay, next up. Jerome also writes, are there movies you feel another character should have been the main protagonist? For example, some feel Mako in Pacific Rim, Brian Cranston in Godzilla, Finn, Kylo, or Luke in Star Wars sequel trilogy. Would doing this have uh, made the stories better? No, nothing. No rudimentary, oh, let's move this piece to, to this spot and that piece to that spot. None of that makes a story better. Your story is a natural flow. Right, And everybody always looks for formula. What's the formula that makes it look better? Listen, if the movie wasn't written well and it didn't have a good flow of story, then just saying this character was the main protagonist instead of this character, that ain't going to fix it. That isn't going to fix it. So no, I don't think doing any of those things would have necessarily made the story better in and of themselves. If they changed characters around and then also changed a whole bunch of other things, Sure, but just moving a couple of pieces around the chessboard doesn't make the story any better, at least not in my opinion. All right, Miguel Zayan writes, Hey, John, have you seen the Ansel Elgort and Ken Watanabe show Tokyo Vice? I have not. I just started it recently, and I've been digging it, especially the Michael Mann-directed episode. What are your thoughts on it? I like my uh, I like Mann portrays places in whatever he directs. Thanks. Yeah, no, I haven't watched it. And listen, Tokyo Vice was something I was pretty excited about seeing. And then I saw the trailer. And I'm not going to lie to you. The, I didn't like the trailers. They didn't seem interesting to me. And so when it did come out, I skipped it. That being said, I've heard good things about it. Like not quite as good as like, say, you know, Chip and Dale, oddly enough, but I've heard good things about Tokyo Vice. So while I have not watched it yet, I'm going to have to get it on at some point here because even though the trailers didn't look interesting to me, it the concept is interesting and hearing good things about it, like you saying you d dig it, I'm going to have to go ahead and give it a shot now. All right. Thanks for writing that in and reminding me about it. All right. Next up, we've got uh, dirt on my boots. <laughs> dirt on my boots. All right. Right. Uh, looking forward to She-Hulk. Her CGI looked fine to me, like the CGI Navi from 2009's Avatar. Tall, lanky, bright color, humanoid. I know there's nine episodes, but I'm sure they're only like 18 to 22 minutes each. Sitcom length. Keep your expectations in check. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that. Like, I was excited to see it's nine episodes. That Even nine is too short, but at least it's not the idiotic six episodes. But the big key is going to be how long are these episodes. I don't need them to be an hour long each. But I just hope it's not like 24 minutes, something like that. I mean, I, I would be disappointed if we saw that. But we'll have to wait and see. Again, as much as I've enjoyed a lot of the MCU shows, that has been a constant pet peeve of mine that they are so short. And they, it makes them either feel like movies that are stretched out too long or shows that are cut way too short. I mean, it's just, they got to figure it out. They got to figure it out. But I'm hoping that each episode will be around the 40 plus minute mark. And then having nine episodes will actually feel like something substantively better than what we've gotten in the other stuff. That's my hope at anyway. All right, next up. James Bonner writes, 
I finally got to see Multiverse of Madness, and despite the myriad of spoiler leaks, I still found enough action and surprises, uh, twists to, to have a great time. Listen, I agree. I have my issues with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. I do. But overall, it's a fun time at the movie theaters for me. I had a very good time. I went to go see it three times. I enjoyed it a little bit more each time I saw it. Uh, but granted, the, the issues and problems I had with the movie were still there. I mentioned on the John Campus show earlier today, it is not top shelf MCU to me. Not one of the better ones that they've done, but still a, a, a worthwhile entry into the MCU canon. Entertaining had some laughs, had some fun. I won't go over all the negatives again. I already did that a bunch of times, but uh, still a good time for me. So I agree with you, James. I'm glad you had a good time, man. All right, next up. Jay Bling writes, regarding the idea of Netflix shows becoming week-to-week -week releases, I started thinking, how many shows are actually worth binging? Even though I binge through shows where every couple, where every episode drops at once, only a few are actually worth a binge for me. You know what? That's true, especially since they... Um, got rid of the uh, Marvel uh, Netflix stuff, right? Like, especially once Daredevil and uh, Punisher and, and things like that weren't there anymore. I mean, yeah, Stranger Things is coming out, right? And that's something that I think a lot of people are going to binge. But I don't know that they have a lot of other bingeable stuff. I mean, it depends on who you are and who you ask. Like, I'm sure The Crown to a lot of people is must binge. Okay, but... Yeah, I, I just think by moving and transitioning to a week-by-week -week release, which is I think they're going to do over the next couple of years, I think they're going to realize a lot more benefits to doing that, including retaining audiences longer and building momentum as they go. So we'll see where they go. That's a really good point to bring up. Like, how much of the stuff is actually bingeable? Great thing to bring up, Jay Bling. All right, next up. We've got Not Right But Wong. Ha <laughs> ha, get it. Writes one of two. I watched Ozark from the beginning, and this finale was awful. So unsatisfying, so many loose ends, and the last few episodes were so boring. Maybe Disney has it right to make short and sweet episodes. Well, no. <laughs> anyway, I'll get to that in a second. You don't need an hour filled with useless scenes. Uh, for instance, the character wants revenge, but they spend large portions with her listening to rap music and driving and more rap music and meeting a rapper. What a waste of time. I forwarded through it. If you don't have a story, don't make it an hour. Well, I mean, I would say a couple things. Number one, I don't watch Ozark. Like I watched the very first three episodes, I'm guessing, of Ozark season one. Ann and I both did because we love Jason Bateman. Didn't really work for us, uh, so we kind of tuned out. I know a lot of people love it, and that's great, but it just wasn't for us, so we kind of tuned out. So I haven't watched it. The issue isn't, uh, oh, shorter means better. No, it just means if make better content. Like, if they botched the ending, then it, the, the ending isn't botched because it was an hour long. It's just because they botched the ending. And whether they made the ending four hours long or 10 minutes long. They probably would have botched it anyway. So I don't think the issue is about the clock. The issue is about find the right length for your particular story. Don't force it to be shorter. Don't force it to be longer. Whatever the natural run of it is, just, just tell your story. And most of the time I find that the problem is with the story, not so much with the length, but eh, that's just me. All right. Thanks for writing that in. And I wish I could offer you more insight on it, but I, since again, since I don't watch Ozark, I can't really say much more. All right. Next up. Spicy Pepper writes, part of comparing everything everywhere all at once to Dr. Strange is Jamie Lee Curtis. She keeps bashing Marvel, posting on Instagram, praising her movie success despite Marvel less and Mav Rick, ick, Maver, ick, and whatever else they throw at us. Uh, seems a little classless to me. I see. I disagree because you have to understand the personality of Jamie Lee Curtis, right? Like I read all that stuff. To me, it, it's I, to me. Look, I, I'm not going to say I'm right for interpreting it this way, and you're wrong. I'm not saying that. But to me, having seen Jamie Lee Curtis, I just saw her at CinemaCon on stage and all that kind of stuff. When you understand he, her, her saying all that stuff to me is clearly meant in fun. I, at least that's how I interpret it. I interpret it when I read it, and I can see her on stage at CinemaCon again, and what her personality is like. I personally take it all as being in fun. So I don't think she's she's actually attacking other people's work. That's not something Jamie Lee Curtis would do. At least to me, it's not. So I think it's all meant tongue in cheek, all meant in fun. At least that's how I interpret it. Anyway, thanks for writing that in, Spicy. 
All right. Next up, we go to Quentin uh, Shibusawa, who writes, I wasn't too excited about Rescue Rangers movie, even though I grew up on the show. But after seeing all the love it was getting, I checked it out, loved every minute of it. So many surprises, the writing and even how things were shot were so clever. Again, Quentin, just adding your voice and your name to the growing list of people telling me that Chip and Dale is actually really good. I've heard nothing but glorious things about it. Uh, like I said, probably tomorrow, thanks to people like you, Quentin, suggesting it. I'm going to have to get on this thing tomorrow and give it a watch. So thank you for adding your name to the recommendation list. All right. Next up, Quentin also follows it up by writing, Unpopular opinion, but I actually like the AMC Nicole Kidman ad. Unnecessary, oh hell yeah. I always smile when seeing it because I know somewhere a John Campia show viewer is also seeing it and making fun of it too. I feel like it's become an inside joke. Listen, be very clear. The ad is a very good ad. The ad in and of itself is a very good ad and should definitely be on TV as a commercial. But it's irritating and moronic to add to the delay of the start of the movie for an advertisement telling us to do something we're already doing. I mean, that's the idea. I mean, it's a good commercial, though. Put it on TV. Tell people you should come to AMC theaters. To me, it's the height of idiocy uh, that you are when we're already 28, 29, 30 minutes late starting the movie because you've done nothing but showed us advertisements for 30 minutes. Let's, let's make everybody wait a little bit longer. Why? Is there a good reason to make us wait longer? Yeah, we're going to show you commercial to get you to do something you're already doing right now. You're sitting in an AMC theater. Yeah, to me, it's really idiotic. But that's just me, Quentin. All right, next up. Uh, Captain Hawkeye Pierce writes, Hey, John, kind of a stupid question, but let's say you are Kevin Feige and you have to choose between either John Krasinski or Daniel Day-Lewis. Who would you rather have played Reed Richards in the MCU? Hashtag stay ready for snap. Um, I, it's, it's not an, a question I can answer. It depends on the script. They're both great actors. Obviously, Daniel Day-Lewis is the better actor. Daniel Day-Lewis is the greatest of all time. He is the GOAT by a mile. Nobody else has ever come close in history. Daniel Day-Lewis is the greatest actor of all time. So obviously, he's the better overall actor than John Krasinski. But I'd have to see a script. And does the way the character comes across in the script a better fit for John Krasinski? Or did the way the writer wrote the script make that character a better fit for Daniel Day-Lewis? So it really all depends. If I don't have a script in front of me and I just have to pick one guy randomly, well, then I'm taking the better actor. I'm taking Daniel Day-Lewis. Otherwise, it's totally up to the script. All right. Thanks for writing that in, man. Okay. Next up, we've got uh, War Doctor 10 who writes, Hey, John and crew. Hello. Uh, watch the Rescue Rangers. More love for the Rescue Rangers. I uh, watched the Rescue Rangers Monday the other day and loved it. This movie should be used as a roadmap on how to use references and Easter eggs and not have them feel forced. Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, again, War Doctor, more love. Be I think we got more people writing in on how much they love this than they wrote in to talk about the Batman. I mean, this is crazy. Well, then again, we all thought the Batman would be good. Uh, this is catching everybody by surprise. So you guys are hyping this up for me. I'm going to go into this thing now, watching it with really high expectations now, but I will have to get around to watch it there. All right. Thanks for sending that in, War Doctor. All right. Next up, we've got Anonymous. And an Anonymous viewer writes in and says, Hello, John and crew. Are you looking forward to the new Searching film? I love the first one with John Cho, filled with so much suspense and shocking turns. Apparently, this one will be a whole new story. Thoughts? Yeah, Searching was one that kind of came out of nowhere, and I was I was late to the party. Like I just kind of uh, low budget indie film. Yeah, John Cho. I love John Cho. That's great, but didn't really look like it would be all that great. Like almost looked like a found footage kind of thing. It's really good, and Deborah Messing is in that, who is really good in it too. Um, I don't know much about the new one, frankly. Considering it's so detached from the original, I feel the same way going into it as I did about the first searching. I don't have a lot of interest, but who knows? We'll see what, what happens. They certainly did pleasantly surprise us the last time around. Thanks for writing that in, Anonymous. All right, next up. Giovanni, the movie canon writes, Hey, John. 
I was able to reserve my photo op spot with Ewan McGregor at Star Wars Celebration Anaheim on Saturday. That's great. If you are still going to Star Wars Celebration this year, I am. And Anne and I are going to be there on Saturday, as a matter of fact. That's when we're going. Uh, are you taking any photos with any of the Star Wars guests? Uh, hoping for your hoping for your mom for a full recovery. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, my mom's not out of the woods yet, but she got over the biggest hurdle, which was surviving her surgery that, that they didn't think that she would. And she did. So uh, everything here on out is easier, but again, not out of the woods yet. Um, no, I have not booked any photo ops at, uh, Star Wars Celebration. I don't normally do stuff like that. Uh, but I did at the last LA Comic Con. We, we got, we got, because Wong was there and we got a picture with Wong, which was pretty cool. Uh, anyway, so, uh, no, I have not booked any photo ops there and probably won't. Even if I want to at this point, they're probably all sold out at this point, but I'm looking forward to being there. We're probably just going to go for an hour or two, just walk around, hang around the positive energy of Star Wars fans. I'm looking forward to that a lot. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, you know, probably grab dinner in Anaheim and then drive home. But anyway, I hope you have a great time there, man. And maybe if, if, hey, listen, if you see me walking around, make sure you come up and say hi. Okay, next up, we got Darren Barnes who writes, Okay, guys, Condor Man is a great film. Absolutely not. Uh, that's it. That's the message. Spread the word. Well, Darren, I'm glad you like it, man. And if you like it, that's all that matters, man. And everything's subjective. And if it works for you and entertains you and brings joy into your life, then I celebrate that. I myself will not be watching it again, but thanks for sharing, Darren. All right, next up, Marcus Steff writes, my first 3D experience was My Bloody Valentine. Oh, like the Jensen Ackles one? Uh, and I love the 3D effect. I thought 3D was the future of cinema experience. Since then, only Avatar worked in 3D. The 3D didn't work for me in Doctor Strange 2 either. Why do you think 3D is back? Oh, I wouldn't say 3D is back. Here's the, 3D is a completely useless gimmick to be honest with you. Now, sometimes it can be pretty neat. You know, the first Avatar movie, absolutely. It had great effect. But when I watched Avatar the second time and it wasn't in a 3D theater, I realized I'm not enjoying it any less than I did when I watched it in 3D. And it's not that 3D, um, it's not that 3D is back. 3D has never really gone anywhere. Like in movies, it, it ebbs and flows, but it's always somewhere there in the background. Then it comes back and all that kind of stuff. But now listen, there's a reason why no TV makers make 3D televisions anymore. Nobody wanted it. It's, it's, it's a stupid, useless gimmick. And listen, when they get to the part point that they can make 3D without glasses, I don't know how you do that. But if they got to a point where you can go into a movie theater and watch a movie in 3D without using any glasses, that'll be a really interesting day. But until then, I have no interest in it. But and listen, that's not to say I haven't enjoyed 3D in some movies. Uh, Avatar, um, the Paul Bettany movie Priest, I thought had very good 3D in it. The um, CG Beowulf animated movie, remember that? That was in 3D a bunch of years ago. I kind of like that. So in some movies it works, but ultimately I'd just rather watch it in a 2D environment. You know what it really reminded me of? I can't remember which movie it was. It, was, it wasn't all that long ago, just a couple of years ago. I was at a big uh, press screening and it was one of the comic book movies and I can't, it might have been Spider-Man Far From Home. It might have been Far From Home. And when you got to the theater where they're having the big press screening of it, they were showing it in two theaters and you as press could select, hey, would you like to go into the 3D screening or the non-3D screening? And everybody went into the non-3D screening. It finally got to the point that the non-3D screening completely filled up. And now then the journalists who showed up a little bit later, they were still on time, but they showed up a little bit later. They'd get there and it's like, oh, the only option left is the 3D screening? Okay. And it's like, this is a great example of that. All right. Thanks for writing that in, Marcus. Okay. And our final question today comes to us from Kitana, who writes, Kitana, who writes, Hey, John and crew, 20th Century Fox is no longer since the merger with Disney, and I was expecting to see the Disney logo in front of Avatar 2 trailer, but that was not the case. Is Disney not in charge now? Why is it still called 20th Century Studios? Yes, because Disney bought uh, 20th Century, but they are still their own operating studio. Think of this, uh, Pixar. Pixar is its own studio, even though it is owned by and under the umbrella of Disney. 
Marvel is its own company, even though it's under the umbrella of Disney. Lucasfilm is its own company, even though it is owned by and under the umbrella of Lucasfilm. And 20th Century Studios is, again, it's its own studio. It is separate from Marvel and separate from Lucasfilm and separate from Disney Animation and separate from Pixar, even though they're all owned by the same, same company. So you're going to see a Lucasfilm thing. It'll be Lucasfilm. You see a Marvel movie, you see the big Marvel intro card. And if you go to a 20th century studio film, it'll say 20th century. Yes, they're owned by Disney, but they're still their own semi-independent uh, kind of studio, just like Pixar and Lucasfilm and Marvel. So there, I hope that explains that. All right, guys, listen, there are still a couple more questions to come from Frankie W., uh, Your Name, Jonathan, Namella, and others. Do not worry. We're going to pick up. There's just a couple left here. We will get picked up on those on Mailbag tomorrow. So make sure you guys tune in and check out Mailbag tomorrow. But for now, that'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for checking this out. Make sure you come back and join us for the John Campia Show again tomorrow. That's it for now. My name's John Campia, and until next time, my friends, bye-bye.